you know, John chapter one, verse one, right? That's it. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Verse 14, the Word took upon itself flesh and dwelt among us. The, the, the reality is everything we know about God, everything we know about God, not hypothesize. What we know about God is revealed to us through His Word. I know God is love because the Word tells me. I know God is forgiving because the Word tells me. I know God is kind because the Word tells me. I know God is merciful because the Word tells me that. I know God is the same yesterday, day, and forever because the Word tells me that. Without the Word, all we would have is suppositions, feelings, traditions, stories handed down from one to another that may have been right in the beginning, but 150 years later, 1,500 years later, 5,000 years later, who knows what that story was? So, you know, I think, I'm sure God's impressed with this, I think it was absolutely God genius to give us the Word because the Word is the same. It never changes. It reads the same to me that it read to our great-great-great-great-grandparents and it'll read the same to my great-great-great-great-grandchildren. It'll read exactly the same. Well, I think God's this way. Yeah, but the Word says He's this way. And you have to come to the place where you go, I'm going to put the Word above what I feel, what I think, what I see. I'm going to put the Word, right? I don't believe in healing just because I've seen people get healed. I believe in healing because it's in the Scripture. I don't believe in salvation because I've seen people get saved. I believe in salvation because it's in the Word. I don't believe in God because I've seen a beautiful sunset. I believe in God because He's revealed Himself to me in His Word. And the more of the Word of God that I put, you know, I, I hear this constantly. If you're in ministry, if you're witnessing to people, you hear this constantly. I want to get closer to God. Well, then spend more time in the Word. And people always look at me disappointed when I tell them that. They always give me this disappointed look. Oh, I thought you were going to tell me some magic dust or go over here, climb this mountain, go to this valley, go do this, get in an airplane, look up. The Bible doesn't say God reveals himself to us in any other way other than the word. Romans said we see his glory in creation, but he reveals himself to us through his word. Matthew, the seventh chapter, Jesus said it once again better than me. If any man hear my word and do it, he'll be likened to a wise man that built his house upon the rock. And when the floods of life come, that house won't fall. Why? Because it was built upon the rock. Out of the mouth of the Savior himself, you build your life on understanding the word and doing it. And if I want to know God, if I want to get closer to God, if I want to experience God's power, I'm going to get it through the word. It's through the word. I can't say it enough. It's through the word.
shower at every song. You see how we come together. The sight of revival door. When we sing, we're coming back to singing your praise. Coming back to the miracle days. We're holding on to Jesus. We're holding on to Jesus' name. Coming back. Follow your ways, coming back to the words that you say. We're holding on to Jesus. We're holding on to Jesus' name. Heaven rejoice together. Waters and suns arise. praise to God, he literally sits down right in the midst with us. 
And tonight I want to ask at Abundant Conference, are there any worshipers here that are, have come to lift up in praise the name of Jesus? Did you come to enthrone our God? We're going to have a magnificent week. But I just want you to be still for a second. Everything we do as a church, everything that we've prepared is for one reason. It's so that you can hear the voice of God speak to you. There's something about when you get your own revelation, when you get your own word from Jesus. You know what? You may have thought you came for teaching. You might have thought you came for worship, but you really came to hear the word of God. The voice of many waters. The one true God who was and is and is to come. So can we just come to an agreement right now that we don't have to poke and prod you to worship God, but that we'll just exalt his name. Can we just lift our hands right now and let's just be still. Jesus, we're here for you, sir. We bow down before you to worship you. The majesty, the splendor, the beauty, the glory of the risen king, the bright and morning star, the fairest of ten thousands, the, the lily of the valley, the lamb that was slain, the bright and the morning star, Jesus, be enthroned on our praise. Oh! 
Tu fidelidad es grande. Tu fidelidad es grande. 
Welcome to Abundant Conference. <laughs> Let me ask you a question tonight. Are you excited to be in God's house? <laughs> I think you can do better than that. Are you excited to be in God's house tonight? Amen. I don't know what's going on in your life, but this I do know. You came to the right place at the right time. Amen. The Bible says when two or more of us are gathered together, he is right here in our midst. What does that mean? It means that miracles will happen here tonight. Amen. We just want to take a moment and pray for you. If you're here tonight, if you're joining us online and you have a need, we want to join our faith with yours. Come on, church family, let's pray. Father, tonight we lift up every person that is standing in your house tonight and those that are connecting online. And Father, we come boldly to the throne of grace. And we declare tonight that we are a people who are holding on to our promises. We believe that those promises are yes and amen. So tonight, Lord, we cast all of our cares on you, knowing that you care for us. And we believe, Father, that even as we worship and even as we pray, that you are moving in this place, that miracles are being set into motion, that no's are becoming yeses, that closed doors are opening, that bad reports are turning around. Father, we believe that you are the God who is more than enough for us. In Jesus' name name. If you believe that your God is able tonight, let me hear you shout Amen. Can I, come on, I just feel like we got to declare this one more time. Can we sing this? You're pouring out your promise. You're pouring out your promise. You're faithful time and time again. Victory is coming. Just like you opened up the grave. We receive it. There are many days ahead, cause you're not finished yet. You're not finished yet. You're pulling out your promise. You're faithful time and time again. Victory is coming. Just like you open up the grave, we receive it. of you have been enjoying opening night of Abundant Conference. And it's only going to get better. But before we go any further, we want to take a moment to recognize some special guests that we have in the room. And that is our first time guest. If you're here at Abundant Church and Abundant Conference for the very first time, we want to welcome you. So if this is your first time, would you just raise your hand wherever it is that you're standing. Let's give them a round of applause all throughout the room. This is awesome. This is great. Thank you so much for being here. Wherever you came from, whether you're here from El Paso or you travel to be there, to be here, we are truly grateful to have you. And if this is your first time, we're going to ask you to do something. On the screen, you're going to see a QR code, and we're going to ask you to scan that code. That gives our team an opportunity to connect with you, to thank you for being here at Abundant Conference, uh, and to help you however we can. We want to make this the best experience that you can have, whether you're here in the room or you're watching us online. And if you're watching us online, it's nothing like being in the room. And so we hope that you're here with us tomorrow night. You all can be seated. I just have a few more things that I want to share with you today. I want to remind you, uh, we have some new merch available outside in the lobby. Not only are we selling Pastor Charles's new book, Endings and Beginnings, 
which we've already sold almost 400 copies of. Come on. But we have a notebook, we have a limited edition hoodie and t-shirt. We have posters that come with sayings from the book, all available outside in the lobby. So we wanna make sure that you don't miss out on getting out all of those items tonight after the service. I think that they're gonna sell out after tonight. So don't think about coming back tomorrow to get your hoodie, because it's probably gonna be gone tonight. Make sure you go pick up your limited edition endings and beginnings hoodie outside in the lobby. And just a reminder, you can purchase the book right now. When you came in, there's a little business card in your little packet. If you scan that QR code, you can purchase the Endings and Beginning book right now and do in-store pickup, which means that you can walk out there after the service is done and just pick up your copy of the book. Pastor Charles will be out there signing books, and so we're excited about that. And ladies, Girls Night Out is coming back February 23rd and the 24th. I hope you're excited about that. Pastor Shannon and her team do an incredible job. It's all about Paris and all this stuff. And so um, you got a little flyer in your packet as well. I hope that you will take it and invite someone, bring someone to church. Let this be the year that we invite people to the church uh, because you'll never know what your invitation will do in someone's life. Um, and so that's all the announcements I have for you today. But we do want to thank our corporate sponsors. None of this is available or is able to happen without the faithfulness and the generosity of our corporate sponsors. And so would you please watch the screens? We want to thank our corporate sponsors. Life Ambulance Service. Laura Baca and Christian Barnes, the real estate powerhouses. Fox Auto Team, Mustang Express, Rick and Laura Hernandez, Classic Industries General Contractor, Rick and Gloria Lara. This ad is sponsored by Dr. Peter Sangra, El Paso Mail Imprint, Alpha Paving, Gabriel and Eliana Chavez. New York Life Insurance Company, Sal and Patricia Parker. The Foot Institute, Dr. Efren Buff de la Rosa. Peter Huerta with Sandy Messer and Associates. Fabian's Fast Affordable Plumbing, Heating and Cooling. Lone Star Contracting and Tarango Roofing and Construction. EP Logistics. Eastside Family Care Center. Best Deal Auto Sales. Alex Melendez Auto and Truck Center. Total Mechanical. AF Business Solutions. Joe Loya with Mayan Solar. West Carriers. Great American Steak Burger East on Yarbrough, West on Mesa Hills. Tom Lepensky, Piano. De Leon Service. CBC, Fine Jewelers. Jorge E. Nieves, Commercial Real Estate, KW Commercial. Master Technologies. Cristina Montes, Law Firm. Cornerstone General Solutions. Kingdom Legacy Benefits, Health Insurance Providers. TLC Hospice Services. New York Times bestselling author, Sarah McCoy. Aldo de Nava and Elvia de Nava, Realtors. 915 Bail Bonds, come visit Montes and Fernie. Kinetic Design Solutions. Belinda Martinez with Humana. Texas Drywall and Paint. Mortgage Loan Officer, Bronco Ixta, Change Home Mortgage. Copa Football Academy. Thank you, corporate sponsors, for your extreme generosity. Amen. Amen. Thank you to everybody. Thanks for being here. How many of you love Jesus on this beautiful Wednesday night? And how many of you are so glad God is on your side tonight? Come on, somebody. On the count of three, give God the biggest shout of praise. One, two, three. Come on, abundant. 
Praise the Lord. Man, what a night already. We're going to prepare now to receive our, our tithe and offering and uh, our offering for the, uh, for the conference. But before we do that, you know, the Bible says give credit where credit is due. And I don't know if you realize this, but tonight in worship, in the first time in the history of our church, other than the opener, every song we sang came from the men and women on this stage and over here from our team from Abundant Worship. Isn't that awesome? Praise the Lord. There, there is a sound rising up from El Paso. Isn't that great? So uh, how many of you can say it's your delight to give into the house of God? Amen? Amen. How many of you have seen God do great things in your life through your giving? Come on, somebody. Praise the Lord. God is our source and our supply. Philippians 4.19 says, My God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. We love that scripture. We amen that scripture. We confess that scripture. But when you go read that chapter in context, that promise is tied to advancing the kingdom of God through your giving. And uh, God's response to our giving is always to provide. Give and it will be given unto you. The law of seed time and harvest is one that has existed from the beginning of time and will exist for eternity. He who sows sparingly reaps sparingly. He who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. And our church has always been a church of generosity. Amen? It's the beginning of the month. Many of us are giving our tithe and our offering. Today, if you want an envelope, we have our white envelopes for our regular tithe and offering. Would you raise your hands up? The ushers will give you one. Or there was one in your brochure. Uh, we should also be putting up the information on the screen for text to give. You can give your weekly or, or I want to say regular tithe and offering, but there's nothing regular about our offering, right? But uh, there, what's the other word, right? So uh, you can give there. And thank you for your faithfulness in your giving. You know, we thank our corporate sponsors because through our corporate sponsors, uh, this conference is free. 99% uh, of conferences around the world, you've, you've got to pay for them. You understand that, right? Uh, but we've never wanted that to be a barrier. Uh, we trust God that through the generosity of our church, through our corporate sponsors, and through just God's provision on our church, that this conference can be church, which is open to anybody. Amen? Come on, talk to me. And it's open to anybody. And the Apostle Paul says, let each one purpose in his heart what he would give. So we're going to receive also our conference giving. And uh, I would just ask, if you're grateful for this conference, uh, that we can all be a part of it. Amen? And, and help make it happen. And help meet the needs. You know, there's a lot that goes on. You understand that, right? This is a big deal. There's, there's a lot that goes into this. A lot of resources are poured into it. And if you can be a part of helping us to meet that budget, it would be greatly appreciated. Every dollar can. Maybe you can give a dollar. Maybe you can give a hundred or a thousand, whatever it is, right? We all give as God has given to us. Uh, but there's uh, the information to give as well for the conference. We also have our blue envelopes. If you need one of those, would you raise your hand up? Those should have been in your brochure as well. Uh, the brochure has all the information about the conference. And thank you for your faithfulness and your giving tonight. Uh, ushers, go ahead and, and pass the containers. Juice, can I get that covenant? I should have brought it up here. No, it's the covenant that Aaron brought down. I'm sorry. It was there. I should have just brought it up here with me. So Sunday is, there it is. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, Sunday is Covenant Sunday. And it's so interesting that tonight, as my dad will be sharing about my mom, that I'm talking to you about bringing back Covenant Sunday because this was her favorite Sunday every year, and, uh, or one of her favorite Sundays, and we're bringing it back this year. How many of you have been here long enough to remember Covenant Sunday? Yeah, Lita, you have, <laughs> of course. So uh, this is the covenant that everybody's going to receive on Sunday, and it has our covenant for the year, and it is a major piece. On the inside of it, 
has Isaiah 54 and then a full devotional that we wrote out for you and your family. We would love for you to come this Sunday and uh, we're going to teach out of this. This is going to outline our entire year for the year as a church family. And uh, so everybody coming on Sunday will get this. And I believe it's going to just launch us as a church into the rest of the year. Amen? Amen. All right, stand to your feet. We're going to worship a little more. And then we'll get into the message. As you know, you know, the journey began uh, when your mom was diagnosed uh, in May of 2012. Uh, little did I know or any of us know that, um, you know, her life would come to an end seven months later in December the 30th of 2012. I was actually here at church. I did the first service and then at the end of that service, uh, I saw all the security guys waiting for me and I knew. So I walked over to them and they told me that, you know, she had passed away at 8.45. I just got on the freeway, just right up the hill here. And I realized I had about 20 to 25 minutes. And, and I realized that my life as I had known it, life that I thought I was gonna live, a lot of it had just ended. So I prayed a very simple prayer and the prayer was, Lord, I can't screw this up, help me. And what made it so significant was that I took responsibility for my life and for all the lives connected to me because I couldn't let you down. I couldn't let your brother down. I couldn't let our kid, grandkids down. I couldn't let the church down. 
I couldn't let my friends down, and I couldn't let him down, and I couldn't let your mom down. That, I believe, was a much bigger prayer than I realized it at the moment. And, and then this journey began to unfold. Uh, and there were times when I felt that, that that darkness would never end, right? I felt that it wouldn't, but I knew that it would because I knew God, uh, He hadn't changed. And uh, He is my Redeemer, my Deliverer, my Savior. And, and He was going to pull me out. I knew that the salvation and the deliverance was in the Word. And so I just began to, to dig in it more than I ever had. You know, John 11, where Jesus is talking to Martha and He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. And I looked up the word resurrection and He said, I am the stand up and the recovery. And then it hit me like a bomb because a part of my frustration was I knew I was on the ground and I kept trying to get up, but I just, I just didn't have it. I didn't have the strength. I was too weak. And then I realized I don't have to get up. He's the stand up. All I got to do is let him stand up. So I was standing there on the, on the, next to my bed and I said, Jesus, stand up within me. And as he came up, I came up with him. I knew, I knew, I'm not, I'm gonna get through this. I'm gonna get better. And then a few days later, I came back to it and I saw the recovery part. We were doing some teaching on King David and I ended up over in 1 Samuel 30. So there he is, his wives are gone children are gone, all of his possessions are gone, his house is burning. Over here are all of his men, 600 of them, some bad boys, picking up rocks to come and stone him. And David goes, I'm recovered. There's nothing around him that says recovery. He said, but I choose to be, not to become. Right here, right now, David said, I'm recovered because of Yahweh and he chose to be recovered. And I said, if he can choose to be recovered, I can. And so right there, I just prayed. I prayed strong. I prayed right here, right now. I choose to be recovered because you are my recovery. And then I read a little further and it says, David prayed. He said, shall I pursue and overtake them? God says, you shall pursue, you shall overtake, and you shall recover all. And the rest is history. And I said, well, if David can do it, and he didn't even know Jesus the way I do, I can do it, and he will do it in me just like he did it for David. So I just began, and I just began to confess all the time, I'm recovered, and I am who I am today because of that word. It brought me out. If I had not gone to the word, I would not be the recovered man that I am today. And I choose you, Jesus, and I choose this resurrection life in the name of Jesus.
so proud that you, you did this and I know it's hard to... um, and I think on behalf of all of us and thousands watching online thank you for the man you are you know Some of you don't know this, but my dad started to write this book several years ago, uh, much closer to the time that my mom went to be with Jesus. And today, Dad, I was actually thinking, I really think this is the most perfect time for you to have done this because everything that you talk about and everything that you believe for, we've all watched come to fruition You have stood up. You have recovered. And my goodness, God has given you so much more. We honor you and we respect you. And there are no words. You know, he told me, I don't know how I'm going to get through this tonight. He's the best of the best. He's going to get through it. And then some, amen. We love you, Dad, so much. Would you guys welcome our incredible senior pastor, the one and only Pastor Charles. God bless. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. I wish I had three days. It would take me that long at least to tell the full story, the whole story. Um, You may be seated, please. Where do I begin? This story begins over 50 years ago when somehow I convinced this amazing woman that you're going to see pictures of to fall in love with me. I'm not quite sure how I did it. I must have been incredibly charming. (laughs) Have you got the pictures, guys? Please. Thank you, Tom. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm going to wait for the pictures. So anyway... Uh, We'll wait, and then I'll stop as soon as they get them up. Are they going to get them up? Okay. Um, If it was just me, I would skip it, but it's too important for her. Um, That was one of them. I cannot imagine the stress that's going on in that control room right now. (laughs) I'm just as cool as I can be, but back there, there we go. That picture was actually taken on the day that we began two services.
Come on, guys. We're better than this. There we go. That was a big day in our life. Another big day. No one liked a party like Rochelle Neiman. That may be my favorite picture. Yeah. So, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. I cannot tell you how much it means to me, and it means more to me than you can imagine for me to be up here tonight and to feel your love and your support. This book, as Shannon said, well, if you don't mind, I'll read the part of the back cover. Ten years after the passing of his wife, Rochelle Charles Neiman, senior pastor and founder of one of the largest churches in the nation, has taken pen to paper for the first time ever to tell the story of how he discovered hope, peace, and restoration in the middle of darkness. His journey towards recovery challenges every reader at the crossroads of an ending and a new beginning to find a new perspective when life doesn't play along. This book will challenge you to discover the courage, the strength, and the grit to gather yourself, get back up, and run full force towards the life of restoration and purpose. Took me 10 years to write it. As Shannon said, I sat down on several occasions to write it, wrote a part of it, had it done, had a contract with the publishing company to publish it and send it out. And I walked into Shannon and Jared one day. And I said, I can't do this. I can't do it. I've just now gotten to the point to where I can think about it and not break down. I can't do it. I can't go around the country and talk about this anymore. So I laid it down. And I really thought that it would never happen. So tonight I want to thank Shannon, Jared, and Carla for your belief in my story and the need for this little 140-page book. So why the book? What's the point? Why, why write a book about such a difficult time in my life and our family's life and in the life of our church? Why write a book? Because sometimes, as you've heard tonight, life just doesn't play along. Can anybody say amen to that statement? It just doesn't play along. Sometimes you get what ESPN calls a bad beat. Doesn't work. Let me give you some examples. Someone you loved with all your heart is taken from you or leaves you. Someone you trusted betrayed you. Someone who should have protected you, harmed you. You were abused. You were lied to or lied about. Maybe the thief of John 10.10, 10, where Jesus gives this incredible revelation to us that is the thief that comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Not God. Not Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. The thief comes. And maybe the thief got through and stole, killed, and destroyed in your life. I can say to you tonight that it has all happened to me and to many of you. So then the question comes, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when life doesn't play along? What are you going to do when you're abused, taken advantage of, betrayed, lied to, lied about? When someone that you hooked your hopes and dreams to 
is no longer there. Someone that you had these great plans with is taken from you or decides to leave you. What are you going to do? I say you have two options. You can quit. No one will fault you. I'm not going to judge you. To be honest with you, there were times when I was moving from darkness to light. There were times when I thought about quitting. I'll be frank with you tonight. I grieved. I cried more than I thought was humanly possible. I stayed up entire nights, never went to sleep, grieving, crying, regretting, asking God to somehow tell Rochelle how sorry I was. Sorry for what, Charles? Because somehow in my darkness, I felt that I'd failed her, that somehow I was supposed to protect her from ovarian cancer. Mentally, I know that's not reasonable, it's ridiculous. But as a man, as a husband, I felt that was my responsibility. I'm old fashioned that way. And I fought this ongoing battle with regret. I thought about quitting. I thought about it. I felt like at times, and I write about this all a lot in the book, I thought a lot, several times, many times, that I was losing my mind. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I thought I was losing my mind. I would be in my car driving somewhere and would have to pull over into a parking lot somewhere because I couldn't remember where I was driving to. I didn't know where I was going. Happened to me a lot of times. I would wake up in the middle of the night with panic attacks felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest and there wasn't enough air in my bedroom for me to breathe. I remember one time I pulled up to my security gate at the housing area I lived in and I couldn't remember the code to get in. I sat there hoping somebody would pull up and I could pull around and follow them in. Nobody pulled up, and eventually I called Jared and said, I'm sitting here at the gate, and I can't remember the code. And he gave it to me, and I punched it in. And That day I pulled in and pulled up my driveway and didn't even pull into the garage. I just pulled my car up and opened the door and got out of the door, and I walked over to the ravine that was behind my house and I stood there and I'm sharing this with you because I think some of you have been there, you know somebody that's there. And I stood there at the edge of that ravine and I said to God, I said, if this is my future, if this is my future, if I'm going to lose my ability to remember and to think and to function, then right here, right now, I think you owe me this. You need to take me to heaven. Because I refuse to live this way. If this is my future, you need to take me to heaven right now. And I just stood there and waited. <laughs> I did. Obviously, he didn't take me. <laughs> so what that said to me, what that said to me was, then you still have a hope in the future for me. But I also understood, so let me go back to my point that you can quit, 
I'm not going to judge you. As I said, I thought about quitting. What's important, though, is what my pastor, Tommy Barnett, called me years ago. It's all right to think about quitting. Just don't quit. It's all right to think about it. Tommy writes his resignation letter every Sunday night. That's what he told me. Writes his resignation letter every Sunday night. Puts it in his jacket pocket on his way to, church, to the office on Monday so he can resign. Because he, he thinks in his mind he did such a lousy job on Sunday. He's going to drive in and turn in his resignation letter. And before he stop, goes, he stops and gets him a Vente coffee. And he said, that coffee has kept him in the ministry <laughs> all these years. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? So he said, it's all right to think about quitting. You just don't quit. That's nice. That's a cute thing to say. That's good preacher stuff. But when you live in it, it's a whole different game. Could I hear a good amen? amen. So I said, I felt like I was losing my mind. I was filled with so much regret. I've had people ask me recently, Pastor, what was the biggest struggle you had? With me, it was regret. It was regret. And I've learned a great lesson about regret. You can't win the battle with it. You can't win it. You cannot win the battle with regret. Can I tell you why? Because you can't change anything that you're regretting. Because everything you're regretting is in the past and you can't do anything about it. It's back there. And no matter how much you add it, it comes up with the wrong number. Does anybody know what I'm talking about tonight? And that was the biggest battle for me. I regretted not what we had. I regretted what we weren't going to have. I regretted that my grandchildren would never know this incredible woman. A woman that all she ever talked about for years and years and years was, was her becoming a grandmother. I used to say to her, you know, I'm going to become a grandfather too. Yeah, well. <laughs> it's just like it didn't register. It was going to all be about her, and it would have all been about her, I promise you that. <laughs> all right? I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. I would go days and not sleep because of fear and anxiety and regret. Fear of the future, fear of being alone, fear of becoming a burden to my children, fear of that somehow I let her down. There were times a lot of you were here. You were here in service with me when I would break down in public, standing on this great stage with this tremendous responsibility on my life. I would just break down. I would stand up here and weep. It seemed to me like forever. I'm sure it was just a few moments. So then I say all that to you tonight to bring us to this question. Can we respond? When life doesn't play alone, can we respond? I'm going to say yes, but I'm going to add this to it. We must. Amen. You must respond. You must respond. Hear me. That darkness is not going to leave you because you cry. That fear is not going to let go because you feel sorry for yourself. The devil is not going to call the dogs off because you don't want to get out of bed. You must and can respond. There is a response to you, for you, in Scripture. I said in the video before we began tonight that I told the story, and I'll just touch on it again now. I told the story about that morning. I was at church, Sunday morning, December the 30th. I came into the Saturday night service on Saturday night, and 
I went back home that night and I could tell Rochelle was not doing well. It was her birthday. And she wasn't doing well, but she had so much fun that day. And, and uh, she wanted to know all about the service and how it went. And I told her about it. And I decided while I was talking to her that I wasn't going to come and do the Sunday services. And I guess she sensed it. And she looked at me and she said, now you're going to church tomorrow. And I said, no, I'm going to stay here with you. And she said, no, you're going to church tomorrow. She said, you've been out a lot. The church loves you. They need to see you. You're their pastor. You need to be there. And you know, when you're married to somebody, as long as I was with Rochelle, there's certain things you know that's just not worth arguing over. <laughs> because there's not going to be an argument. It's already settled. Can I get a witness on that, on that, right? And that was settled. So I got up the next morning, came to church, at the end of the first service, I stepped down and I looked over there and our security guys were waiting for me. And I knew, I knew what they were gonna tell me. It was a long walk. And they came up to me and told me that she had passed away at 840 that morning. I want you to know that the only reason I was here was because she made me come. I would have been with her. So I set things in motion that morning. All this is in the book in great detail. I don't know why I'm telling you all these details, but it helps me if you don't mind. I set things in motion and I brought my staff in. I felt so sorry for them. I still feel sorry for them. I still love you all. And I told them that Rochelle's died. They all cried, we were in the back. I said, I'm gonna ask you to do the hardest thing I've ever asked you to do. You've gotta go out and do two more services. When it comes to the teaching and all that, they're gonna run the tape from the first service. I said, you can't tell anybody, you can't tell your families, you can't tell your spouses, you guys have to just keep quiet until we decide how we're gonna handle this, how we're gonna release the knowledge of it. And they did it somehow, some way. Incredible people. So I got in my car a little after 1030. I drove up the hill, got on the freeway. I was listening to some Hillsong praise and worship music in my car. I couldn't call anybody because all my friends are pastors. <laughs> and all of them were in church. <laughs> and the out of town guys, the guys that live in foreign countries were all asleep. <laughs> and... Uh, all of them told me later, you should have called me anyway. Yeah, I should have. But really, I think I needed a few moments. I knew I had about 20, 25 minutes to myself from here to the west side where I lived. And I realized as I was just on the freeway that life as I had known it and planned it was over. All of my plans were connected to her. Does that make sense to you? It was us. It wasn't me, it was us. It was Rochelle and Charles. It was never Charles and Rochelle, it was always Rochelle and Charles. <laughs> you know, for being five foot two, she really was a force. I mean, five feet, she really was a force. And those of you that knew her would say, amen to that, and force would be in all caps. <laughs> and, uh, and I knew at that moment that I was not prepared. Now here it comes. I was not prepared for this moment. We'd never discussed it. We'd never talked about anything other. The last sentence Rochelle said to me on Saturday night was, I'm going to get better. So scripture in Hebrews the 11th chapter that says that people die in faith. Rochelle died in faith. It's the best one. So 
I prayed a prayer. You heard me talk about it on the video. And the prayer was, and I quote, Father, I can't screw this up. Help me. Looking back 10 years, I realized that there was something in that prayer that was going to become a great force in my life. And I share it with you. If you have had a body shot, if you have gone through some of the things or, in the, or you know somebody, one of the things looking back now that I realized in praying that prayer was my commitment to the people connected to me. I can't screw this up. This was my life, my children's lives, my grandchildren's lives, and this phenomenal church that God has graced me to be a part of and to pastor. I could not. I could not screw all that up. And I needed God's help. And that commitment, listen, listen, I'm doing this to help you. Your commitment to the people you're connected to will give you strength to get up and go forward. I'm going to say that to you again. Your commitment to what you are supposed to be and the blessing that you are supposed to be to the people you are connected to and will be connected to, if you recognize that commitment and you embrace it, it will give you the strength to get up and go forward. I would, I know some of you will say, wow, how did you get that? I'll tell you how I get it. It's a simple verse. I didn't realize it at the time that, you know, the Bible does things in you that when you see it, you don't know it's doing in you until you look back and you see that it did things you didn't know. Don't ask me to repeat that. I don't think I could. <laughs> but the reality is, is that there's a promise and it's a big deal to me. It's a big deal in our church. It's one of our pillars of who we are. God said, as for me, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. And that scripture had lived in me for so long and transformed my thinking and my approach to life so much that I could not, could not screw this up. I couldn't fail my children, my grandchildren, all of you, my friends, and people I didn't even know yet. And most of all, I couldn't fail him. I couldn't screw this up. My choice and your choice has effect on other people. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, I said before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. That both you, read it with me, and your seed may live. I think accepting that responsibility also gives you a great privilege. The responsibility that my choices matter not only to me, but to everyone connected to me. What a responsibility, but what a privilege. Can I hear a good amen tonight? <laughs> Un without thinking about it that morning, I made a positive move in my life hear me now, to search the word and seek the Lord for answers for my life. Let me say that to you again. I made a positive move that morning and every morning since then to search the word and seek the Lord for answers. I knew that I would not find recovery in the bottom of a wine bottle. In my darkness, which I've told you about, in my fear, my grief, my regret, my guilt, I decided this was not the abundant life Jesus came to give me. I stand before you tonight thanking God for this book.
Now, there'll be some that'll laugh at me and mock me for that, and some on social media, bruck, 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 bruck. say whatever you want, Bubba. You haven't lived where I've lived. You haven't seen what I've seen. You haven't experienced what I've experienced. You can, but you haven't. You mock us because you don't know. That's okay. Your mocking does not change what I know. My, your mocking does not change what we have experienced. And that you can build your life on this book. And not only can you, you must. Because in Matthew 7, Jesus said that life brings storms. Did somebody say amen to that? Life brings storms. Bring storms. And you want to build your house on the rock, which is hearing and doing the word. Hearing and doing the word. Hearing and doing the word. You build your house on the rock. And if you don't, if you hear the word and don't do it, you build your house on the sand. And sand foundation is okay till you get a storm. I thank God that 40 years before I went, had this encounter in my life, I was taught to do that. God brought teachers into our lives that taught us the authority and the power of the word. That we hear the voice of God when we hear the word. The psalmist said, the angels hearken to the voice of the word. So the word has voice. And it speaks to us. It's amazing to me how many people I see around today on Christian media and Christian television and Christian this and that, that, that kind of have put that aside. And it's all, well, I got to go somewhere. I got to hear. God, you got to speak to me. He's speaking to you. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help somebody not. He's speaking to you. I would not be standing here tonight, the man that I am and the man that I'm going to become, without that word. It is the word. For well, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's the word. So I made a positive move to search the word and seek the Lord for answers. And in my darkness, my fear, my grief, my regret, my guilt, I decided, John 10.10, 10, this is not abundant life. And I'm going to go get my abundant life. And out of it came some thoughts that I'll give you quickly that, that popped up. I spend a lot of time talking about in the book. And one of them was... Uh, the Lord led me to John the 11th chapter. We sung a song about it tonight. In John the 11th chapter, it's the story of Jesus with Lazarus. Just a couple more minutes, okay? Everybody okay? Amen. Story of Jesus with Lazarus. And there's an interesting trend, uh, situation that takes place there, right? And in verse 33, he said, Jesus therefore saw her weeping, the Jews also weeping with her. He groaned in his spirit and was troubled, or it says he troubled himself. Now, it's not troubled, there's not a bad word, it's a good word, meaning he stirred himself up. But notice here, it says he groaned in the spirit, right? And then further down, I think it's in verse 35, 30, anyway, it says Jesus wept. I think it's 36. So he groaned within himself, and then he wept. And then in verse 38, it says he groaned within himself again. So he groaned, he wept, and he groaned. And I saw that and I was like, well, what, is, what is that? He groaned, and then he wept, and then he groaned. And so I looked, you know, those of you come to church, you know me, I got to look up words, right? And I looked up the word groaned and it said he became indignant. So he became indignant and then his humanity came and he wept. But he didn't stay in the weeping, Jesus. He came back. And it wasn't the weeping that raised Lazarus from the dead. It was the indignation that raised Lazarus from the dead. You catch what I'm saying to you? Nothing wrong with weeping. Jesus wept. I wept. David wept. <laughs> 
Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. And he's got a book in the Bible with his name on it. So I continued, and, and, the, and the word groaned also means Jesus roared. He roared in his spirit, because the next verse said, and with a loud voice he said, Lazarus, come forth. And you know, there's preacher, preachers being preachers. I heard one preacher say one time, do you know why he called his name Lazarus? Because if he hadn't, everybody in the cemetery would have been coming up. I don't know if that's true or not, but sounds good. Preach is good. That's either Tommy Barnett or Pastor T.D. Jakes have come up with that. This is one of those two guys. And uh, so he raised him. And I remember that night I lay there and I was, I was, I'd been in bed and I couldn't sleep and I got up and I just felt like I needed to read this chapter like I'd never read it. It was about three o'clock in the morning. I hadn't slept in a long time. But let me tell you something. Always understand this. Nobody said this to me, and I found it out, and that's why I put, wrote the books, and why I'm talking to you tonight. That no matter how dark you may be, how dark the darkness is in your life, your light is coming. Yeah. And the scripture says. It is the entrance of his word that brings that light. And so I looked at that and I realized I needed to get my roar back. And that roar comes from your indignation. I became indignant. In West Texas, we would call it something else, but we're a church tonight. And <laughs> how many of you know what two words I'm thinking of? And I became those two words. It was slow. And you can do the same. You got to get mad at the injustice of what's happened to you. It's okay to get mad. Listen, it's okay to get mad at your enemies. It's okay. Nothing wrong with it. Some of you need to get your, your, your roar back. The next thing I remember the Lord teaching me was out of Paul's life. And I began to look at everything that Paul went through. He was beaten, robbed, shipwrecked, beaten again with rods. Three times he was beaten with rods. Can you imagine they stoned him one time until he died. He died. They beat him multiple times with whips. Was shipwrecked, left in the ocean. His friends betrayed him. People that told him, told him that they were believers betrayed him, robbed him. He spent an entire winter one time without proper clothing, freezing. He had to write a letter to a guy and ask him to bring him his coat. The Apostle Paul. And I looked at this list and I noticed something. I was reading it one day and I looked at it and I noticed there was one thing that was left out. He listed all these things he went through and there's one thing he never said, why me? Why me? Why me? He never said that. And I, made, I realized, and I made this simple statement. I'm not the first man that lost his wife, and I won't be the last. The universe did not align against me. I'm going to quit thinking, why me? It doesn't matter, because when you ask why me, listen, I'm trying to help you tonight. When you ask why me, you know what you're doing? You're staying in the past. There's no life in the past. That's why they call it past. It's gone. There's no life in it. Life is in the now and in the future. And so I, I began to think that way, right? Then, of course, in John 11 chapter, you saw it on the video tonight. I won't spend much time on it. I then began to allow Jesus to be my stand-up and my recovery. 
And because he is my stand up and my recovery, I can choose to be recovered just like David did. I can choose to be recovered. I remember the night when that came alive in me. Again, I was in my bedroom and I'd move my study materials upstairs and and uh, cuz I would like I said I'd be up <laughs> all hours. And so I just felt the Lord bring me back to John 11 and I read that I am the resurrection and I read that and you know what he wants to be your stand up in recovery too. And it became so alive to me. I literally came out of bed and I was standing in my bedroom and I lifted my hands towards heaven. And I heard Jesus speak to me in my heart and he said, you can't do this. You can't get up on your own. Let me stand up. Listen, and because I'm in you, when I stand up, you will stand up to me. And listen, what he did for me, he'll do for you. I don't care what knocked you to the ground. I don't care who knocked you to the ground. I don't care how long you've been on the ground. I don't care, ma'am, I don't care, sir, how hard you've tried to get up. You can get up tonight because the stand-up lives in you. And I'm not being cute, I'm not being preacher, I'm not being funny. There ain't nothing been dealt that he can't stand up from it. He can get up from it. And he got me up. I remember seeing it in my heart. I can see it as if it happened right now. I can see him. Oh my God. Getting up. And I got up with him. And then I began to move towards recovery. Because he is, I choose to be. Does that make sense to you? And then the last thing I'll share with you tonight. I discovered in my life and, and in talking to other people that as a species, we are not good with endings. We're really good with beginnings. Right? We love beginnings. Right? Baby's born. Woohoo! Everybody's shouting. Everybody's hollering. It's great. It's wonderful. Right? Great. Oh, you're starting first grade. <laughs> right? We could go on and on. We love beginnings. We're good with beginnings. We're opening the new company. We got the ribbon. We got the big silly scissors, right? We got all of that. We got the groundbreaking. It's all exciting. It's beautiful. We're really good with beginnings, but we don't know what to do with endings. And endings are part of life. Right? I... I Remembered all the stuff, the first date I went on with Rochelle, the first time we kissed, which was on the first date. And <laughs> my mama didn't raise no fool, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, the, when we first told people, well, I could go on and on and on. And then I'm going to get sentimental. I'm going to start crying and we're not going to get an hour till 11. All right. <laughs> And uh, so I, I remember all the, I remember when we got married. I remember when Shannon was born, when Jared was born. I remember when, when they got married, when we had our first grandkids, and when we started the church, and we, we had our first service with 100, and our first service with 500, and our first service with 1,000. I remember all that. I remember when we built that building next door, when we built this building, which everybody said, you can't do that in El Paso. Well, just stand back. Watch. Now, if you've never heard me before, I'm going to take about 30 seconds. I'm going to give my little speech that I've been giving for years. And my little speech is this. We don't got to live in Dallas to do great things. You can do great things right here. You don't got to live in Houston to do great things. You can do great things right here. You don't got to live, you don't got to live in San Antonio or Austin. You know what somebody told me the other day? Do you know what somebody told me the other day? Somebody came up to me the other day and said, well, you know, pastor, this isn't Lubbock, you know. Lubbock? <laughs> Lubbock. It used to be Dallas and Houston and San Antonio. Now it's Lubbock. Now we're. No, 
nothing against the fine people of Lubbock. <laughs> There's a scripture in John 19, chapter, verse 30. Jesus is on the cross. Listen to it. John 19, verse 30. And it says that Jesus said, it is finished. And I looked at that one day and I went, wait a minute. He said, it is finished. The truth is, the disciples thought he was finished. He was just getting started. Now hear me. It may be finished in your life. It, a relationship, maybe you had a dream job that ended, maybe you something. It, does that make sense to you? It is finished. But the end of an era is not the end of your destiny. The end of a relationship is not the end of your life. It may end. You're not done. Separate the it from you. Does that help you? I separated the it. It ended. My time with Rochelle ended. It ended. But I wasn't done. The devil will try to tell you that when you have an ending, you're done. What endings do, listen to this verse. This verse knocked me over. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning. What? Look at verse 10. He ties it back in. Say not thou. What is the cause that the former days were better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this or if you think that way. You're not speaking with wisdom. Let me tell you what the issue is. A couple more minutes. Jesus explained it to us in Luke the 8th chapter. You know what our issue is? We love the old. In Luke the 8th chapter, Jesus said, you got to get new wine for your new wine skins. Look at that. With every ending, God has a new beginning for you. But our problem is, as a species, we like the old. The, we, Jesus said, you, don't, you know what your issue is? Say, you say, the old is better. But the old is is over. So the end of a thing can in truth give you a new beginning because Jesus is ending in beginnings. Now, where did I get that? Where did I come up? Well, it says it in the book of Revelation. Jesus is Alpha and Omega, beginnings and endings. Well, if he's beginnings and endings, then he's also endings and beginnings. If he's o Alpha, then he's Omega. And if he's Omega, then he's Alpha, Right? Because he is both simultaneously. He's not one and then the other later. He is both at the same time. So in every ending, he is standing there ready to give you a new beginning. Did you hear that? There's a new beginning for you. There's a new beginning for you. And so one day he spoke to me. I'm almost done. He spoke to me in Genesis and he said to me, I want you to read Genesis 1 like you've never read it. I went, okay. Okay. So I went to Genesis 1 and I saw something, right? Verse 5. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. Next. And God called the firm in heaven and the evening and the morning were the second day. And you know the story, right? And the evening and the morning were the third day. And the evening and the morning were the fourth day. And the evening and the morning were the fifth day. And the sixth day and the seventh day. The evening and the morning. And I looked at that. And for the first time in my life, I went, What? We don't, that's not how we think of days. We think of days as evening, I mean, as morning to evening. Now, does God know that? Of course God knows that. Then why did he do that? Why did he call a day evening morning? There's only one reason that makes sense. Because he wants us to always know that God is always moving our lives from darkness to light. From darkness to light. From darkness 
to light, from darkness to light, from darkness to light. And I'm telling you tonight, no matter what kind of darkness you may be in, and I explain it to you in great detail in the book, God is moving you from darkness to light. I don't care how hard winter holds on, spring is coming. I don't care how dark it is, as soon as that sun breaks the horizon, light is here and darkness leaves. You are constantly moving in your life. So you may be in here tonight hurting and grieving and darkness is in your life. You may be hurting over some abuse or some lie or some betrayal or some loss in your life. And I'm glad to bring you the good news of the Bible tonight and tell you your light is coming. And it is bringing you a new beginning. Let Jesus be Lord of your ending, that he may bring you a new beginning. Amen? I want you to do me a big favor tonight. Will you do this for me? All right, we're going to take a couple of pictures real quick. And I want you to do this for me. First of all, they're going to be up here. And I want to see all of your smiling faces. <laughs> smiling. Now don't be goofy. <laughs> don't have to ruin everything. <laughs> be like your savior and be good. <laughs> all right, so you ready? Okay, this is the first one. Where's my camera guy? There they are. Hurry up guys, I'm ready. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> All right, everybody smiling? Come on, give us your charming. You know that look I'm talking about. Are you ready? Oh, now, you got your posters that were on your seats? All right, get them out. Make sure they're reading the right way. All right, now I want you to hold them over your heads. Ooh, look at, that's cool, huh? That looks good, doesn't it? My blonde haired daughter, Lucia. How's it look? Does it look good? Do I look good, Lucia? Thank you. And the book. Whoops, I forget. All right, are we done? Beautiful. Can we pray? Can I pray with you real quick? Can I pray with you tonight? Don't you love those posters? That was, uh, I think that was Shannon's idea there on those things, those things like that. Hey, look, in a moment, we're going to dismiss and I'll be out in the lobby. I'd love to sign your book. I'd love to take a picture with you if you'd like. Uh, But I'll be signing books for weeks to come. All right, so if you buy one tonight and you don't want to wait, that's cool. Just bring it back. I'll be here to sign them for you. All right? Be my joy. You don't know. There's no way you can know. How grateful I am for the love of my family and for your love. Many of you in this room walked with us and me in particular through that tragedy. And here we are, 10 years later, standing up and recovered to God be the glory. All day I've been singing this song. I'm not going to sing for you. I'd have to charge you extra if I sang. It's an old song. Andre Crouch sung it. How can I say thanks for all 
the things you have done for me. Things so undeserved. Yet you did to prove your love for me. The voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude for all that I am and ever hope to be. I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory for all the things that he has done. Things so undeserved. To God be the glory. Lift your hands towards heaven. Lord, we honor you and thank you tonight. Lord, I pray tonight for anyone and everyone that is here tonight that the devil has pounded their life for the abused, the hurt, the lied to, the betrayed. For those that should have been protected but were hurt instead. And there is room in your house for all of us. And there is healing in your kingdom for everyone. Be their stand up in their recovery. Be the lion of the tribe of Judah in their hearts that roars. Be the more than enough God that looks beyond our faults, sees our need, and comes with salvation. You are our Redeemer, our Deliverer, and our Savior. You have a hope and a future for us. And we are not, we are not going to screw this up. <laughs> right here, right now, say it with me. I choose to be recovered. Right here, right now, I can smell the houses burning. But right here, right now, I choose to be recovered because you are my stand up and my recovery. You are in my ending and you're giving me a new beginning. My light is coming. Now say it again like you really mean it. My light is coming. One more time, I want you to shout it. My light. Come on, now you got it. Say it one more time, best you can. Scream it. Get your roar back. Say it again. Come on, one more, one more. Your light, what? One more time. I want to hear the roar of the lion of the tribe of Judah in your heart. Say it right now. My light is coming. He cannot help but get to me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here tonight, you've never made Jesus Lord of your life. All that I talked about tonight is available to all of us, but it all happens for us because Christ is in us. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Jesus said, if any man come to me, I'll find no reason to reject him. No reason. He wants you in his family. He wants you in his house. And tonight he's ready to give you salvation and forgiveness of sins. Maybe you've made promises to God and didn't keep them. Get in line. <laughs> God, if you get me home tonight, I'll never drink again until next Friday. I'll become a missionary to China, and yet I still live in El Paso. God loves you. He has a hope and a future for you. He wants to shed his love abroad in your life. In a moment, I'm going to lead the whole church in a prayer here in the service and online. If you've not made Jesus Lord of your life, this is your night to do it. He's been knocking on the door of your heart all night. Are you ready? If you'd say to me tonight, Pastor, I'm going to pray. I'm going to become a child of God tonight. I want Jesus in my life. I've never seen him like you described him tonight. I've just thought of him like a fairy tale or like a fable or somebody back in the ancient time never knew that he was real and alive and would get in, get in your darkness with you. Yeah, that's him. 
And he wants to be in your life. And he wants you to know him in a personal way through his word and by his spirit. So if you'd say to me tonight, Pastor, when, when you lead everybody in prayer, I'm going to pray with you. If that's you right now, put your hand up. Just raise your hand up right now. Raise your hand. I want to see it. Hands are going up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Hands are going up. Every section, I want to see your hands. Pastor, pray with I'm going to pray with you tonight. Let me see your hands tonight. I'm going to pray with you tonight. Spectacular. You put your hands down. Is there anybody else? Pastor, I'm going to pray. I've thought about it for a moment. I'm going to pray. Don't leave me out. Let me see your hands tonight. Pastor, I'm going to pray with yes over here. Thank you. Others, let me see your hands up in the risers. Wow, it's so beautiful. All right. I want all of you to raise your hands. Everyone else, pray with me. Say it out loud with me. Lord Jesus, it's all about you. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I ask you now, come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I believe in my heart that you died and rose again for me. You did it for me. And I receive you. And all that that means into my life. Come live in me. Be my Lord and Savior. Teach me how to live. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, can we applaud all these people that prayed to rejoice with them tonight? If you raise your hand and prayed that prayer, they're going to put a QR code up. Please scan it, answer the questions. We're going to sing a praise and worship song and then service will be over. I'll be out front if you want to sign the book. All right? I'm steady there. I'm steady in your name. Recovered by your grace. I Speaker from Mexico will be here. Israel Houghton will be in worship. Be here tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. We love you. Have a great night.